Hi, oh, g'day, Nigel here from SAC School. Well, welcome to our SAC School Live for, actually, this is our very first SAC School Live. So thanks for coming and joining us. And I'll tell you what these sessions are about. We're doing these sessions each week, and the idea really is just to get together and have a bit of a chat, talk about saxophone stuff. Hopefully, I can share some tips that'll make learning saxophone a bit easier for you and get to help you with any questions that you might have about learning saxophone. Um, so I'm Nigel. If we've not met before, if this is the first time we're meeting each other, I run a thing called Sax School. So actually, you might have seen me on YouTube. I, I do lots of video stuff. But Sax School is a big community of online saxophone learners. We've got thousands of people learning sax, saxophone through Sax School all over the world, actually. Particularly a lot of people who are coming to saxophone later on in life or um, adult learners or people who are uh, just making a start. But um, you know, at that beginner or intermediate stage. Also, we've got a lot of people in SAC school who are learning specific skills like improvising or jazz theory, harmony, stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Anyway, so that's what I do. Um, but today, in today's session, I've got a couple of different topics, three different topics actually, that I wanted to quickly cover from questions I've already got from you guys. But if you are on the call and you've got a question, then let me know in a comment because I'm gonna try and get through as many of those comments as well. So. If you're here, jump on, give us a thumbs up or a, a, um, a like, and uh, let me know your comments uh, if you've got a question. Anyway, just tell me who you are and whereabouts you're from, because I'd love to know. Now, I can see there's a bunch of people on the call already, a bunch of familiar faces, which is good to see. I should tell you, I've got my uh, one of my team members with me here helping out. This is Claire. You want to say hi, Claire? Hi. 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 So Claire uh, uh, helps me out behind the scenes doing all the magic and uh, all the wizardry. And so Claire might be getting back to some of you guys and some of your comments today. Um, so if you see somebody called Claire that's getting back to you, it's not me, it's Claire. Okay. So um, I'll tell you what, before we get started with those comments, I wanted to give you a quick overview or uh, update on what's been going on with SAC School. So I mentioned there's lots of people using SAC School and there's tons and tons of lessons in there and I'm always making new lessons. In fact, every week there's something new that comes out. And this year, I've been doing something a bit different where I've been releasing a lot of courses inside SAC School. So um, just in the last couple of weeks, just to give you an idea of the things that have been coming up, um, I did a course, actually really interesting, I did a course on creative improvising for saxophone. Um, I so that's just come out in SAC School in the members area. I'll tell you quickly what that's about. It's a, uh, the whole idea really is that if you're an improviser, then you've probably reached that point where you, you, you know the theory, you know the notes, you know what modes to use, but you might be really struggling with how to come up with something new, something different, you get a bit stale in your playing, happens to everybody. And that's what this course is really all about. Oh, look at these people and there's tons of people here, Claire, isn't there? Hi everyone. Yeah, great to see a bunch of people in here too. A lot of familiar faces, great to see. Thanks for coming along guys. So Creative Improvising for Saxophone is a new course that is inside Sax School. And I've been getting some great feedback from a lot of you guys actually who are on the call now, which is really great. And I think it's, it's interesting because it's pushing people into different parts of their playing that they wouldn't normally go in. Uh, and it helps you to develop as a creative person. And that's really, really important when it comes to improvising. So that's the first thing that's uh, been happening inside the members area. And the other thing is I've been actually tell you what, if you're using that Creative Improvising course, if you're a sax school member, how about you just give me a quick, what do you do? A heart or a thumbs up? Come on. Yeah, awesome. Um, the other thing that's happening in sax school is each month I do a thing called a jazz performance pack. Now these are really cool. So the idea with the jazz performance packs is as saxophone players, one of the things that's so important for us to, uh, to have, to understand or be familiar with are jazz standards because they're kind of like our vocabulary as musicians. So each month in sax school, I release a new jazz performance pack. And the way these work is I take a standard that you really need to know and I teach you everything about it. So the melody and pull the harmony apart uh, and uh, give you some great tactics on how to improvise over it as well and get a really cool backing track. So this month we were looking at the tune Maiden Voyage, which is a Herbie Hancock tune. And it's one of those tunes you really need to know. So. That's new in sax school this week. Uh, last week, I think it came out, but this month. So loads of new stuff going on in there. Brilliant. So don't forget, if you're on the call and you've got a question, 
then put it in the comments because uh, either Claire or myself will try and get back to you. I'm going to try and answer as many comments as I can. But good to see Bob here, Ian's here, Alan, um, Suzanne Pierce. Brilliant. Actually, you know, that just reminded me. I just responded to a question from Adam, from Alan Speller just uh, this evening. If you are, uh, if you've ever experimented with synthetic reeds, um, then you'll know that there's loads of different reeds on the market. And, um, you know, I tried lots of synthetic reeds and I never really liked any of them, if I'm honest with you. Tried them, gave them a good, a good test out. There's plastic cover from Rico, there's Barry reeds, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. But uh, about a year or so ago, I started experimenting with Leger reeds. And Alan was asking me whether it's something that he should try because he was struggling with reeds not being consistent. Um, and I was saying to Alan, you should definitely test them out. I know there's a couple of people in the group here that aren't massive fans. I know Ian Sims not a, um, a big fan of them, but I personally love them. So there's different types of Leger reeds. I use the Signature uh, and I find they're great. In fact, every saxophone that I've got, I use Leger reeds on. They're a bit more expensive, but they last a really long time. So actually I find that they're better value for money. So it's definitely worth checking out. Ian's asking why you're hiding. It's because you can reach a keyboard over there. Okay, so if you have, uh, if you've ever tried, if you've tried synthetic reeds or if you're a Leger player, let me know that in a comment as well. Thierry is saying that he also uses Leger signature. Is there anybody else talking about reeds in there? Let me know, Claire, if anyone else leaves a comment in there. Ian uh, said that he's, he's tried fibre cells. Fibre cells, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fibre cells are another popular brand. Um, I, when I tried fibre cells, it's interesting, Ian, because you and I disagree on this. You, I think you found that Leger was breaking down for you, and I had that same problem with the fibre cell, particularly if I was playing a really loud gig, they wouldn't last very long. But it really depends on your embouchure, your mouthpiece. Um, but for me, the Legers are really stable as synthetic reeds, so I'm finding they're great. Cool, good to see uh, Roger Renard saying that he likes using them and John Carl is using them too. Brilliant, okay, so questions. Now I've got a great question here from, who was that first question from, Claire? Was it from, uh, oh, Rich, Rich Bowen, there we go. So yeah, Rich was asking about low notes. I thought this is a great topic for us to have a quick chat about today. So Rich is saying, um, I'm struggling with low F all the way down to C. I can relatively easily slur down to those notes. Um, but getting without slurring down is getting really, really hard. And he's, he's saying that he's getting the octave above. Um, this is a really common problem. If you've ever had this problem of struggling to get down to those low notes, you know, let me know, give us, a, give us a thumbs up because that's a really common problem, particularly if you're just relatively new to playing saxophone. So what we're talking about here is, you know, imagine if you're going from C down to low C. Okay, so getting those notes out where you're slurring down works, but if you try and hit the notes straight on, sometimes you get the octave above. That sort of thing. I'm getting the octave above, it's an overtone note. But there's two real reasons why that ever happens. Well, there's three, but there's two main ones, okay? The first one's got to do with your embouchure and your throat. And this is a good tip for anybody at any level of their playing. Often what's happening there is you're closing off with your throat. You're being tight around here. It's closing off your airway and constricting things. Uh, and um, and that causes the saxophone to jump to the overtone. You can hear it sounds really uneven for me there. If I open everything out like this, like imagine if you just woke up in the morning and you're yawning, you know, and you're breathing really, really deeply and all of your throat's really open. And that's really the way that you should be any time that you're, you're playing, but particularly for those low notes. So if I have everything really, really open down here, so the sound is more open but it's also much more stable so having an open throat super important and that'll help you with the high notes as well as the low notes so that's the first thing the second thing uh i'm just watching all the comments here it's tons isn't it it's great so suzanne's saying that she likes using the share reads as well brilliant 
Okay, so the second thing is got to do with uh, how much mouthpiece you're using. And this is a mistake I see lots of people make. So if you're using too little mouthpiece, it's really hard. That sort of makes that whole first issue a lot, lot worse because you've got a lot less control over the reed and the reed can't vibrate as well. So what you really want to do is use a little bit more mouthpiece. And if you're struggling with this, and this might be what, what's going to help you, Rich, if, with this question here. Try using a little bit more mouthpiece and that's going to open up your sound and it's going to make those low notes a lot more stable. So if I use a little bit of mouthpiece, it's a lot more unstable and thin, but a more mouthpiece and an open throat. So it's a much bigger sound. So if you look across here, and we've talked about this before inside sax call, but if you're new to sax, this might be something that you weren't aware of. You know, the mouthpiece bends upwards and the reed goes straight. So there's a point where they come apart. It's normally about a centimeter and a bit in from the end of the mouthpiece. Obviously, it depends if you're on a soprano or an alto or a tenor. But that point, that's where you should have, that's where your, your lips should be on the mouthpiece. And often it's more than what you think. So experiment with having an open throat and experiment with using a bit more mouthpiece, and I'll bet that'll sort the problem. So if, uh, you know, if you're having tr that trouble too, it's definitely something worth trying. And the third thing, I mentioned there is a third thing. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally you might find that it's actually a mechanical issue. If you can get the notes from C down to G okay, then there could be an issue with the linkage around the F here. Um, and it, basically, if you can get from C to G and that's working fine, you've tried your embouchure, you've tried your open throat, and you're still having that problem, then it might be worthwhile just going to your repairer and getting it checked out. But I reckon that the open throat and the embouchure is gonna sort that out. Does that make sense? Yeah, Claire's nodding over here. So, so she's, she's agreeing with me. And um, all right, great. So what was that question? Who's that from? Uh, Joseph's asking about pitch bending. Pitch bending, yeah, okay, good question. Well, you know, I guess, uh, that is a good one, actually. Um, so often we bend notes down and bend notes up. And most of that is done with your embouchure on the saxophone. There's a couple of different techniques. That's why I'm hesitating, because there's a couple of different ways you can do. But let's say, for example, um, so often a lot of big band jazz stuff. <laughs> sort of stuff you're thinking like um, you know classic big band playing and that happens in lots of other styles as well but all of that sort of pitch bending is all done with your embouchure so the the trick there really is to have control about the, the amount of pressure that you're using with your embouchure here and experiment with relaxing your jaw to bend down and then tightening back up to bring the pitch back up again <laughs> So in that example, for as a, you know, as a good good example of it, I'm starting with my jaw quite relaxed, which makes it very low or bends the pitch down flat, and then I'm tightening it up to lift it back up. So a lot of the pitch bending is all done with this. Beyond that, though, it's really about fingers, chromatic scales, and using rundowns. And there's tons of lessons on my YouTube channel about that. Also inside the Sax School uh, members area, I've got tons of lessons about using chromatic scales. So, good question. Radio. Um, there's a good question there from John Carlo, too, isn't there? I'll tell you what, yeah, look at that, um, Claire. And while Claire's looking at that, I just want to quickly um, get on to the second question, because this, this is a brilliant question. So, this was in our members group, and uh, there was a discussion going on about microphones. And um, the question was really about when you're performing, what's a good professional microphone to use? So there's a couple of different options here. I thought that I could give you, I mean, there's a ton of different options, but there's two so common ones. So this is called a Shure SM58. Shure, S-H-U-R-E SM58. I bet you've seen one of these. There's about a billion of these floating around the planet somewhere. They're really, really popular. But the good thing about that is, it means that they're everywhere. They're consistent, they're inexpensive, I think in England, less than 100 pounds. They're really well made, they're durable, 
and um, you know you can go just to a gig just about anywhere in the world and you'll come across one of these microphones now often if you're on a gig somewhere this is the microphone that they have for the vocalist but they also work great for saxophone now there's two variations of this this is the 58 but there's a Shaw SM57 which basically looks like this but without the ball part on the end so it looks more like this I'll show you it looks more like that now these are good consistent microphones they're not the best microphone but they're going to make a good clear sound and these are a great thing to have in your gig bag with a lead and you know throw a, a mic stand in the boot as well so this is a you know a, a great mic that's going to get you out of any trouble and it's going to work great doesn't matter whether you're playing in a in a you know local pub or whether you're playing on a stage in front of 20,000 people this will still work um, but another option is something like this a clip-on mic now when I'm gigging this is what I use so a bell mic or a clip-on mic is a awesome awesome tool because it just frees you up um, with movement so clip on your on your bell like that there's tons of different types this one here is made by a company called AMT and actually, I don't know if they, I think I've made a newer version than this one. This was called the Y5, WI5. Kind of expensive, this one. Maybe it's about a thousand pounds. And the beauty of these, two things. Well, first of all, I mentioned that it gives you a lot more freedom. So you don't need to stand in front of that uh, microphone stand all the time, all night long. You can move around, which is great. But the other thing I like about this is this particular version is wireless. So I don't need to, you know, I can move anywhere. And gives me a lot more freedom so there's there are cheaper um, wireless options on the market and there's even ones that you can buy that look more like this uh, and then you've got the option of having them wired or or wireless and you might have a pack on your on your belt or a pack on your saxophone that's the sender so I think wireless mics are a brilliant invention so you can't really go wrong with either of those two and if you just want to get something to get up and running quickly then the sure SM58 is a really safe bet. If you've got a really huge budget, then there's a ton of other options. You could spend, you know, that's a hundred pound microphone. You could spend a thousand pounds on a microphone in a heartbeat. There's so there's so many expensive options, but that will get you out of problem. And there's plenty of people that that's the only microphone they've used in the whole career. If you've got one of these, actually, let me know. Or if you've got a wireless mic, let me know as well, because it'd be interesting to see some uh, some conversation in here about which is the um, ones that you're using. I can see Emmanuel is talking about the SM57 is used on guitars. You're right, it's used for lots of different instruments. They use them on pianos, they use them on all sorts of instruments. Um, so this is a good question from Ian. He's saying, do you find the bell mic booms a bit on the low B and B flat? Yeah, now that's a good question and I wanted to quickly touch on this. So choosing a microphone is a good, uh, your good first thing that you need to think about but equally important is how you position the microphone when you when you're recording so if you've got a microphone like this that goes on a microphone stand imagine my arm is a microphone stand then really when you're playing you want to be about this far away from the bell of the saxophone okay the sound most of the sound comes from here some of the sound comes out of here as well but what you don't want to be doing and i see some people doing this is getting right in like this because if you're that close in on the microphone then all of the low notes are gonna be super loud and it's gonna be really a, not a great sound. So you wanna be at this sort of distance away from your, your mic and that works perfectly. Now for a clip-on microphone, obviously you can't get that far away because the thing's clipped on your saxophone, right? However, there's a different technology in these microphones. So these are condenser microphones and they behave differently. I don't, on this particular microphone, the low notes pop out a little bit more in, but not a load more. The sound is quite balanced. And equally with this, I can have it like that, so it's further away, or I could have it closer in. If I was doing a really quiet gig in a quiet venue, I might have it further away like this. If I was playing outside on a big stage in front of a really loud band, I'd probably have it a bit closer in because um, it gets a more consistent sound for me. Okay, Charles is asking condenser versus dynamic. Well, this is a condenser microphone and this is a dynamic. So um, it really depends on the type of microphone that you're going for. The, the other big difference about these two is this doesn't require any power. 
and this one does. That's why it's got a battery pack on it. So yeah, there's, there's an endless discussion with microphones. You can go down that rabbit hole as far as you want to, but if you just want to get started, something like this is a good first option. Any other questions? Any other people using wireless microphones on there? No, I think that was mainly the comments that we've had. We're Brilliant. We've picked up already, yeah. Okay. Great to see all you guys leaving us comments in here today. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. So, and don't forget, if you've got another question, leave it in the, uh, in the comments because I'm gonna, we've only got a few minutes left. But I do want to try and get through as many as I can. Um, oh, I, I thought, you know what, I should just tell you too, uh, before we go on to the third question that I had for you, is uh, what I've been up to this last week. And because um, I wanted to talk a little bit in, in each of these sessions about, you know, some tips about practicing and stuff that I'm working on. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I've been on holidays last week. <laughs> so I haven't been doing any saxophone playing. I've been off camping and doing fun things with my kids. But that does mean that today being Monday, I've been getting back into the studio and practicing today. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when I have had a few days off and I get back into practice, because I still practice all the time, then I'm always a lot more systematic about the way that I'm practicing. So I'm focusing on things like long tones. I'm working with my tuner. I'm working with my metronome. I'm spending more of my practice time on technique and uh, you know, working on my fitness, basically. And I think that's a really good point for all of us when we're practicing saxophone. We need to be very structured with the way that we practice. I wrote a book actually about this. A lot of sax school members already have this. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Practicing Saxophone. And in that book, I talk a lot about the way that you break down that, um, you know, your practice time so that you can be really effective and cover all of those elements. Actually, Claire, can we share a link for that in the, in the comments? Yep. If you... If you're not a sax school member, or if you haven't got a copy of that book, I definitely suggest it's an e-book and it's really a short read, but it's packed with stuff that's really useful to you. I'm a big believer in the um, importance of practicing effectively. The reason is, if you get that right, then you're gonna be learning faster. You're gonna make loads more progress. You're gonna enjoy the whole process of learning. And you're gonna also develop some really good habits that will serve you well for you know your career as a saxophone player, whether that's working professionally or just working um, playing for your own enjoyment. So yeah, so Claire's shared that in the comments there. Yeah, fitness. Yeah, fitness is a big one for everybody, I think. Uh, Ombush your fitness when you're playing. So uh, I'm all, I've been playing forever and I'm still working on that all the time. Very, very important. Okay, so um, great to see all these comments in here. So Charles is asking, how much should the underlip press the reed? You know, this, that is one of those questions that uh, you could spend a long time talking about. The short answer is, I don't think, Charles, that you should be using much pressure at all when you're playing. And if you're experiencing a sore lip, and a lot of people get a sore lip where the teeth start to bite through their lip, um, then that means that you're getting tired and you should be having a break. Uh, also means you're biting too hard. So you definitely don't wanna be putting too much pressure on. The long answer, is that there's lots of different variations on how you have that bottom lip on the uh, in your embouchure when you're playing. And when pretty much everybody, when you start to learn saxophone, they'll tell you the model of having the lip over the teeth, which really is an easy way to get started. But as you get more experience and your embouchure gets stronger, then really you can use less and less lip over your teeth. And in fact, if you just get your lip and push it back against your teeth, you'll notice that part of it goes over your teeth anyway, and that's really all you need. And after that, it's thinking more about having a round, a round control of that mouthpiece when you're playing, as opposed to a vertical, sort of lateral up and down biting movement. A nice round movement, uh, pressure like that, is gonna give you a much better, rounder sound, and it's gonna stop your lip from being sore as well. So that's a good tip. Hope that's helpful to you, Charles. I have a question here about long tones. What's the question? Can you practice long tones on, long note, on low notes and high notes in the same session? Yeah, that's is that Christoph, Christoph mm -hmm, Christoph's asking that? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question too, Christoph. You know, uh, I think a lot of people will only practice long tones in one part of their range. But for me, I think it's really important to practice it over your entire range because long tones are beneficial to you, Christoph, in different ways in different parts of your range. So if you're just, if you're a relatively new player, starting in the middle, say between 
C down to G, uh, even down to F. It's very easy. It's going to help you to very quickly build your muscle control. But as you develop as a player, working down into your low notes, like we were talking back earlier on in the session about keeping your open throat and more mouthpiece, um, thinking about those things when you're playing your low notes right down to the bottom of the range, down to B flat, it's really going to help you with your breathing and your embouchure control. And similarly, all the way up to high F sharp is, is going to, it's so important to help you with the embouchure control again and your openness and the amount of pressure that you got on that mouthpiece. So I think looking at um, low notes, uh, long notes rather, in different ranges is super important. You can do it in a couple of different ways. You can just pick different notes, you know, a couple of notes in my middle range, a couple in my high, a couple in my low. You could, what I prefer to do is work in octaves. So maybe start somewhere easy like low G and then high G and then A and high A, B and high B. And that way you can compare the feeling of the note in the bottom register where it's comfortable and then in the top register where you've got to remember to be more relaxed. So yeah, I definitely think doing it in different rate, uh, ranges is super important. Unlike what Ian's saying about doing altissimo high Gs, I think that's, if you can do it, brilliant. I'll leave that to you, Ian. Maybe you can uh, play that for me next time I see you. Okay, so we've got time for just one more quick question. Oh, this is an important question, actually. Uh, so Mark had asked a question about the position of the neck. Now, this is a good question. Okay. I'm going to show you on my alto for this. So Mark was saying, the question was, is there a certain spot where my alto neck should be lined up with? I found one article that said it should line up to the center line of the neck with the octave key, but if I line mine up, the bells and the hand are in an awkward position. Okay, so the way that I always approach this is, yes, it's what Mark is saying. Basically, if you look at the underside of your neck, so nearly every neck on the saxophone has got this ridge, and then at the top of your body, you've got the octave riser here. And what you should always do is line up the octave riser with that line on the neck. And that's generally the way that saxophones are designed to be uh, correctly aligned. That way, the octave riser is going to work on this octave key um, efficiently. Now, different models of saxophone and different manufacturers will have, when you've got that set up that way, will have the alignment of the body and the bell in different positions. So this is a Yamaha, classic Yamaha 62. It's what most modern saxophones are based on. And you can see with this one, when I've got it aligned, my bell is over this way a little bit, uh, but not too much, just enough so that if you were playing sat down like this in a big band, it's, it's comfortable and it works. But I've seen some Chinese manufacturers where they're very, very off. Um, so, Different manufacturers do that position in different ways. But I've not really come across a saxophone where ergonomically it doesn't make sense. You know, in other words, from your head and your arms and where your hands are, all of that generally feels all right. It's just that the bell might be over here. And that's a manufacturer to manufacturer thing. If you look at this tenor, in comparison, it's almost straight in line. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe all tenors are like that, but I've definitely seen more variation in the altos. So rule of thumb, ridge under the neck, octave riser, get those two lined up, and that's definitely the right thing to do, Mark. So if that's what you're doing, you're on a winner. Okay, so um, any other questions? There are loads of comments in here today, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, let me have a quick look. Okay, oh, so... Oh, yeah, should you keep your mouth on the reed for the entire range of long, long-term practice or remove... After each set of notes, between each set of notes. It's really up to you. Who's asking that question? It's disappeared off my screen. All right. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> rushing past quick, isn't it's it? It's going too fast. Yeah, it's going <laughs> too fast. I mean, it's up to you. I, I like to think about keeping everything really consistent when I'm practicing. Oh, Michael Green. Oh, Michael. Okay, cool. So, so what, Michael, when I'm, when I'm practicing my long tones, I'm really thinking about consistency because I want to get, I really want to get the most out of that long tone session. So I'm thinking a lot about my embouchure my throat, my breathing. So I tend to not reset my mouth too much. So I get it right, think about it, and then I'll do my series of notes as opposed to sort of stopping and breaking. It really is up to you. I think the most important thing to think about though is um, concentrating on the consistency of your embouchure. 
Okay, guys. Well, hey, look, there's brilliant. Uh, it's been brilliant to see so much feedback uh, on the call today. I'll be doing these each week for the next few weeks at least, and we're going to hopefully have some fun. And if you think of something that you wanted to ask today that you didn't, um, maybe you can meet me again next Monday at 8 o'clock, same place, and um, pass your question on that way, and, and I can get to answer your question next week. Um, also, uh, in the meantime, if you're not a SAC School member and you want to check that out, I have got this 30-day trial running on SAC School. I, you know, I know it's 30 days and it's free, but my approach to it is really I'd love for you guys to try it and see if it's right for you. Uh, if it's not, there's no hard feelings, but I think you're probably going to really get some benefit from it. Thousands of other people are using it, and you can get that 30-day trial over at mcgillmusic.com. I think Claire again put a link in for it. Um, and that way you can jump in, try it out, try some of those courses I was talking about, like the creative improvising course, or getting started with sax, or the uh, jazz modes, um, or you know ear training, there's tons of other things, or some of those jazz performance packs, or any of the 600 other lessons that are in there. And um, you know, see, see how it works for you. I think you're absolutely gonna love it. Um, also, don't forget, if you wanna find out more about practicing techniques, there's that ultimate guide to practicing saxophones I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can get that from my website. We'll put another link in, in for you here for that too. So have a brilliant week. Thank you for sharing uh, this last half an hour or so with me. It's been really great to see all of your feedback and um, all your comments and all that sort of stuff. Practice hard, and we will catch you. Let me see. Yeah. So we'll catch you next week. Have a great week.